I've got a number of free picks for this Sunday card coming your way in just a moment. Last Sunday, 2-0 sweep with the complimentary plays. Um, but first, I want to talk about something, a story that I came across a few days ago. Many of you may have seen it. It was on Yahoo, and it was done by Frank Schwab, who does a number of their gambling stories. Uh, the state of New Jersey has become the number one sports betting state in the country. Now listen, Frank didn't have to tell you that, and neither did the state of New Jersey. I've been in this industry since 1989. Uh, I've been in it since the days that they were doing 976 numbers for a dollar a pop, selling you sports betting information. Uh, I've been in it since the 900 number industry as well. Uh, I took that industry to the internet some 22 years ago and really created the foundation of this business that you now see online. And I can tell you from those days in the mid 80s, the tri-state area, which is Philadelphia, New Jersey, and Delaware has always been the number one sports gambling area in the nation, bigger than New York and LA and Chicago all put together. That's how big it is. Not only for the amount wagered, but also for the number of, uh, of the amount of revenue generated from pick buyers as well, hands down. Now, the gist of the story was this. Um, New Jersey announced that from the beginning of the year through the end of October, their profit was $608 million. Yeah, these other states that don't want to have legalized gambling, just give away that money. Let all those bettors in other states like, uh, well, I can't think of them off the top of my head, which states don't have, well, I know Texas doesn't have legalized sports gambling, for example. Yeah, let those people call those illegal offshore sports books owned probably by Americans in San Jose, Costa Rica, and let that money go offshore instead of coming and enriching states' coffers. $608 million, that's how much gamblers lost. And of that amount, over 50%, $335 million was lost on parlays. The moral of this story is this, and I've been saying this for 30 years, people that bet parlays, you're effing morons. Because parlays are sucker bets. Mathematically, it comes down to this simple equation. It's hard enough to win one game, let alone win two, let alone win three, let alone win four, and hook them all up and then think that you're going to win a parlay. But people play parlays because they see those extravagant payoffs, the big odds, and they see the dollar signs. Again, mathematically, the odds are stacked against you. But you will see and hear the stories about Oh, this guy needed Michigan to cover yesterday, and he hit a 10-team parlay, and he won $175,000. How many times do you hear those stories? Few and far between, right? That's the problem. A lot of guys will play one or two games on a Saturday, and they'll throw a couple of dollars down on a far-fetched parlay. Casual gamblers account for so much of that $335 million that New Jersey made. Parlays are sucker bets. Always will be, always have been. Nothing will ever change because gamblers are always looking for the big payoff. It's the same reason that people go and play when the lottery is multi, multi billions of dollars. I'm exaggerating, of course. Chances are you're not going to win, but you want to have a little action. But they're ridiculous. Now, of course, listen, after the story, there was, of course, you know, a number of comments on the story. And of course, there was one guy who said, I won three parlays the last time I was in Nevada a few weeks ago. Just need to know what you're doing. Yeah, that's like the fish story about the one that got away. Typical gambler response. You always hear about the winners, never hear about the losers. Yeah, right. Okay, listen, let me get to my complimentary place. Uh, I mentioned to you last week, and a number of weeks actually, that, you know, I ATS trends are just total BS. There's some guys in this industry, a matter of fact, one that I'm not going to mention his name. I've known him for, uh, God, I've known him for 30 some years. He's got tip sheets, all types of publications. Uh, I knew him when he was a nobody in this industry doing 976 numbers. You know, uh, uh, Team A is favored over Team B because they're 17 and 1 against the spread, against teams with winning percentages under 30. Uh, 350 when they're wearing striped socks on a Thursday and months ending in R. You know, I mean, just esoteric ATS trends. 
whatever ATS trend you come up with supporting one side, I can find seven trends supporting the other. It's just computer generated BS. I have always relied on beat writers because they are your eyes and ears. And the internet has changed the handicapping industry in that regard. I can get online, I subscribe to, I subscribe to 19 different newspapers. I have access to so many more. And, you know, I rely on them to cover the teams for me. And they, those beat writers are all, have the pulse. Their fingers are on the pulse of the teams. They see them in day in and day out. So I mentioned to you last week that I like the Eagles against Denver. And there's one particular site I read all the time, NBC Sports in Philadelphia, that three of their beat writers, uh, three of their writers that cover the Eagles and that all that I respect, two of the three guys like the Eagles, like I did, and turned out pretty well. Well, today, Philadelphia is at home against New Orleans. Uh, Philadelphia is a two and a half point favorite. They're coming off that 30 to 13 win at Denver. The Saints are coming off back to back losses, 23-21 at Tennessee, 27-25 at home two weeks ago against Atlanta. These are not your Saints from previous years. Not only not without Drew Brees, Michael Thomas, um, Alvin Kamara, both of their starting offensive tackles. The Eagles, their rookie head coach, Nick Sariani, you know, the coconuts fell from the trees. Finally, he started to realize a couple of weeks ago, it's like, my God. My rookie quarterback needs some help. We got to start running the ball. And now they've averaged like 200 yards rushing each of the three games, had 216 on the ground against Denver. It is true that New Orleans has the number one rushing uh, defense in the league, allowing only 73 yards a game and 3.1 yards per carry. But this Eagles team is running the ball. What I don't like about Denver here is that they got Trevor Simeon at quarterback. Um, it's a must-win situation for New Orleans, especially since if they want to keep their playoff hopes alive with the Bills and the Cowboys coming up next. But I like Philadelphia in this spot. But let's go to the writers. One of them, Reuben Frank, and these are all straight-up records for these writers. One of them, Reuben Frank, who did not like the Eagles last week, he liked Denver, is 8-2 straight up with his picks involving Philadelphia this year. Well, he likes the Saints 19 to 17 in this game. So he likes New Orleans. Another, Dave Zangaro, who is 9 and 1 this year, he liked the Eagles last week. And this week, he likes the Saints 20 to 17. Ray Dittinger, who also liked the Eagles last year, uh, last week, and is a Hall of Fame writer, worked for NFL Films. I, I've been reading his stuff for, my God, since I was a teenager. He likes the Eagles to win outright, 21-17, and of course that means they get the cover. So this week, two of the three guys like the Saints. I like the Eagles in that game. Uh, also on the late afternoon card, um, you've got the Cowboys taking on the Chiefs. Um, Chiefs, a two and a half point favorite at home. Here's the thing with the Cowboys. Yes, they came back after that horrible performance against the Broncos a couple weeks ago and they bludgeoned the bad Falcons team 43-3 uh, last week. Um, they're 4-0 against the spread on the road, 3-1 straight up. The problem with the Cowboys, and this is where the dummies, yes, I think they're dummies, that don't get vaccinated, they cost their team. And I can't imagine Jerry Jones, for all he pays this guy, Amari Cooper, isn't a little pissed off that he's going to be without Amari Cooper today and for the next game too. Now, granted, guys that are vaccinated also can have to go into the league protocol and can get COVID as well. But because Amari Cooper was not vaccinated, he is going to have to miss two games. And to have to miss this game, mm, that hurts, especially with the Cowboys on the road. Now, the Chiefs are playing, obviously, a little better here. They did beat the Raiders 41-14 last week. I don't think the Chiefs, granted, Patrick Mahomes, five touchdowns, 405 yards, but the Raiders, you know, were discombobulated. I mean, they just were a disjointed team after that horrific accident, not accident, uh, what's his name, the wide receiver, he killed that woman because he was fucking, can I say that? He was drunk and he was going 155 or 153 miles per hour in his Corvette, and he slowed down to, what, 120 or 117? Oh, should I say allegedly? Before he killed the woman. Oh, allegedly. So I can't imagine the Raiders were that focused on that game last week, but anyway, they sucked. Um, but I like the way Kansas City is playing right now, and I just think in what's going to be a slugfest, 
getting the Chiefs minus two and a half points at home when the Chiefs have so many more offensive weapons right now than Kansas uh, than the Cowboys do. And also the Chiefs activating Clyde Edwards Hilaire, I think that gives them one other weapon as well. Now, here's an interesting thing in the Dallas Morning News, uh, Michael Gelkin, I think that's how you say his name, he is the Cowboys beat writer. He likes Dallas 31 to 28. So just a thought. But I would go ahead and take the Kansas City Chiefs minus the two and a half points in that particular spot. Uh, another late afternoon game is Seattle. Really a must-win game for the, uh, I was going to say the Supersonics. Oh my God, the Seahawks minus the two and a half points in that one. Um, you know, which Arizona team are you going to get today? The one that really sucked last week in the 34-10 home loss to Carolina or the one two weeks ago uh, that played like gangbusters at San Francisco. Both of those teams were quarterbacked by Colt McCoy. Last week, only 169 total yards though, in the loss to Carolina. Now, Colt McCoy probably is going to start today, although Kyle Murray, game time decision. But I got to think they're going to rest him, take advantage of the bye week, and let him get totally healthy for the stretch drive. DeAndre Hopkins is once again out. Pete Carroll says he wants to run the ball after only having 11 carries for 43 yards last week in the loss to the Packers. Problem is, it you know, who's going to run the ball? Alex Collins, Rasheed Penny, who, you know, is probably suffering another injury as I speak. Uh, it's a smart strategy with Arizona giving up 4.8 yards per carry, 31st in the league. Um, Russell Wilson last week returned from the finger injury. He was not the Russell Wilson we were used to. Obviously, they were trying to protect him going out of the shotgun or the pistol formation on every single snap. Uh, the Seattle defense only has 15 sacks on the year. That's 1.7 per game. That's 29th in the league. Um, you know, they're going to have some problems probably defensively because Jamal Adams and their cornerback DJ Reed are both questionable for this game. I will tell you, this is another situation where one of the writers I always follow out of the Seattle Times, Bob Condotta, I think is how you say his name. He's four and five with his straight up picks involving Seattle this season. He likes the Cardinals to win this game 23 to 19. But one of the other beat writers that covers the Seattle Seahawks, uh, Adam Jude, he's six and three with his picks. He likes Seattle 17 to 16. But of course, Seattle is a two and a half point favorite. So he likes Arizona as well. Both are on the Cardinals. I do like Seattle minus the two and a half points here in this spot. I think that Russell Wilson is bound to play better the second game back from the finger injury, so I'm going to go with Seattle. On the early card today, I'm going to go with Miami, minus the three and a half points, buy down the half point on the Dolphins. Um, I was impressed with their defensive effort against the Ravens. I mean, listen, you know, uh, the way they constantly blitz, uh, their safety splits to combine 38 times in that Baltimore game. They sent their defensive backs 24 times the 48 times that Lamar Jackson dropped back the pass. Um, I was reading in the New York Post and the story that they had, that is the most times, uh, according to Next Gen Stats, since they began recording that particular stat, that that has happened since 2016. you got a Jets defense that has allowed, in the last four games, 175 points, 1,890 yards. If the Dolphins blitz repeatedly, is Joe Flacco going to be able to avoid that blitz? I don't think so. So I'm willing to go with Miami. I don't think it's going to be a high-scoring game. I think, you know, if either one of these teams break 21 points, I'll be shocked. But I do like Miami in this spot. So of the three picks, um, I like Miami number one. Kansas City would be like number 1A. Uh, Philadelphia would be the second tier. And Seattle would be the third tier. That's how I've got them. That's a wool roll. And I wish you well and talk to you again soon.